Then after all, they got on the other side of the Red Sea. They worshipped the Lord in the song of Moses. So you can read that. Okay? Go back, I believe, to chapter 15 and read that, the song of Moses, which is an awesome song. There's also reference to the song of Moses in the book of Revelation. You can read that. The manna has already taken place. The giving of the manna. The people, remember, they cried out against the Lord. We want to go back to Egypt. At least we had food. God rained down manna in the mornings, gave them commandments on how they were to take that up. The water at Merah, where that water was bitter, he made the bitter water sweet there. Folks, this is all within three months. And then, ultimately, the Ten Commandments were given in Exodus chapter 20. All within three months of took place, all of that. And we find ourselves now in our text at chapter 32. We find ourselves at a place where Israel, they're impatient. They didn't trust in God. They didn't trust in Moses. And they were turning back to Egypt. And they got Aaron, Moses' brother, to make a carved image. And we think, wow, how can I, how would I forget something like that? Ask yourself that question. How soon do we forget? Now, the results of their impatience, we need to know this, it will not go unpunished. It will not go unnoticed. There are results for their impatience. You ever heard the old saying, haste makes waste? And folks, I've learned that time and time again. And I'll probably learn it again tomorrow. How hard it is to learn patience. Israel did not tr fully trust the Lord. Look at verse 4, going back to chapter 32. We see, we see what took place. They received the gold. He received the gold, meaning Aaron, from their hand. And he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a golden calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. The results of their impatience and not fully trusting God led them to worship a false god. Now you might think, well, how did this take place and what does it, how does it apply to me? Going back to our text this morning, that self-seeking and envy, there's many things to say about that. How the result is, it says, every evil work is present. Whenever you do not fully trust in God, when you do not fully trust and listen to His Word, and as they did not trust Moses, they did not fully trust that God was using him, they were led to a false worship. We also need to understand there is possibly spiritual warfare taking place here, encouraging them to also worship Baal. You need to understand in the terms, or in, should I say, in the realm of your spiritual walk, in the realm of religion, that if you try to approach religion or anything spiritual without fully trusting the Lord, you've opened the door to the devil. And you need to know something. When you open the door to the devil, he doesn't just creep in. As soon as the crack of the door is open, it's like somebody knocking on your door and you kind of, like this, as soon as that crack of that door is open with doubt and unbelief, with impatience and self-seeking or whatever, you've opened the door completely because he will barge in. He'll bring every friend he has into your life. You need to understand that. It's a very dangerous thing when we're approaching spiritual matters without fully trusting in the Lord, without fully took looking to him, believing in him and all that he said. And this is exactly what Israel has done. They were not asking for the one true God, but they were asking for other gods. And this led them down the slippery slope. We might call it today backsliding. We might call it today a falling away. Whatever we call it is, they were going down that slippery slope whenever they asked Aaron to fashion a calf not asking for the one true God, not giving to the one true God, but looking 
for another. Now, we also see the punishment in this chapter. Uh, the results of Moses being up on the mountain and what God had said to Moses, your people who you brought up. We need to understand something here. And this may not, this doesn't come real natural to us. This doesn't come as a Christian. You don't want to think this way. But at this point in time, because Israel was disowning God, God was disowning them. Oh, no, Brother Shannon, that can't be the way it is. God would never do that. Just a few weeks ago, remember I talked to you and let, let, let you see for yourself in Scripture. You go back to Romans chapter 1. Because the people were suppressing what they knew to be true, God gave them over to reprobate mind. If you don't want God, if you choose not to serve God, even you choose not to say anything about Jesus in the, in the, uh, among men or outside of the church or even in the church, if you don't confess the Lord, what does he say? He won't confess you. And there's even going to be a point in time, and this is hard for us to grasp, but there's going to be a point in time, you can read this in Matthew chapter 25. This is New Testament, folks. This is grace we're talking about. In Matthew 25, he says, To those who do not believe, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What's he going to say? I never knew you. He disowns you. And you might think, no way, God's a loving God. Yes, He is. But God is just. And He is holy. And you, when you come to God, folks, you better take Him serious because He takes you serious. He takes your life serious. And He knows and understands your heart and He sees your decisions that you're making and how you're making them. And are you fully trusting them? But you need to also know this, that the devil is waiting for every chance he can get to take you away. He's waiting for every chance he can get to distract you and keep you off the path of righteousness. Here's what Moses did. We find in verse 20, Moses burned, had the golden calf burned and then he ground it into powder and made the people drink it. The haste makes the waste thing? What a waste. You think, well, that's what you think, well, why did Moses do that? Moses had to get rid of that. He had to make a statement right now. You see the waste and all the gold that took place here? Not that we serve gold by any means, but this gold was intended to use or be used for the building of, of the Ark of the Testimony and things like that. But he ground the powder down, made the people drink it. And then there was a judgment that took place. Moses said, he who was on the Lord's side, let him come to me. The Bible says the Levites came to him. And he said, thus saith the Lord today, to go out throughout Israel. And that these men went through Israel, and the Bible says that 3,000 men died by the sword. They died that day. You might think, wow, that's really, that's quick, swift punishment. It doesn't seem right to us to think that way, but this is exactly what happened. Remember, what seems right to a man leads to death. This is what God said to do. This is the direction He gave Moses. And then... There was a plague that visited them. A plague put on them. At the end, we find that in verse 35. And I want you to ask me this, or ask yourself this, does God take me serious? Does God take my life serious? Because this is my concern, folks, with the people in the church. And I know this is the church that I'm called the pastor at. God, this is what's concerning me. Do you understand? Do you fully understand how serious God takes your decisions? Do you fully understand how serious God takes your life right now where you're at? It doesn't matter right now whether you're a teenager or whether you're someone who's well seasoned out in the faith or in the church. It doesn't matter whether you're a new believer or someone who's been believing for a long time. Now, yes, those who do know more are expected to know more and they're going to be required of God to know more, but He takes every one of us serious. And for us to dabble in sin, for us to play around with the world, is a very, very dangerous thing. Well, Shannon, Brother Shannon, we're in the age of grace right now. We're in the 
the age of grace and it's all different now than it was then. Is it? Yes, it is. Let me tell you about grace compared to the law. Grace demands more. Did you know that? We use the excuse of grace for our sin. Well, it's, it's grace now. We can, you know, God forgive me for our sins. Yes, He will forgive you. The Bible says if we confess our sins in 1 John 1 and 9, that He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you, have you not heard what the Lord Jesus Christ said when He's on this earth? You have heard that it was said that He was speaking of Moses here. You have heard that it was said, Thou shalt not murder. But I say, and this is grace now, but I say that if you think in your heart and you say Raka to your brother, you might think, that's a funny name, but it's something that took a lot of <clears throat> hatred to say. If you say something so hateful that this comes out from you, it's made so hateful. If you say even that, you're in danger of hellfire. You're in danger of the punishment. That's grace. At the time, they were commanded by the Roman soldiers to go a mile. Walk a mile and pack the Roman soldiers' stuff. Jesus said, don't just go one mile. Go two. That's grace. Grace demands more. We use the excuse of grace for doing less. But grace demands more. Think about that, folks. Think about how serious God takes our life. Do you not understand the seriousness that He saw in coming to this earth and dying on the cross for you? Was that for nothing? Was that just for a show? Folks, that is serious. You see, He just wasn't involved in the sacrifice. He was committed. Amen? Amen. Do we not as well owe Him our lives and commit to Him? Now, according to Exodus chapter 14 and verse 31, we may, we may ask questions about Israel. Did they really believe in God? Where were they at? Now, Shannon, come on. They just, these are people that were still, you know, they were unbelieving people. But look at Exodus chapter 14 and verse 31.